to welcome everybody to CX Behind the Scenes, no, otherwise known by its acronym CXBS, but without the BS. I am your host, Carl Charisse, and I am a consultant with Horizon CX. We do fundamental training on customer experience for those new to the profession and some of those who are just sort of in the profession but don't have all that background information of what they should be doing in what sequence they should be doing in a very fundamental program. We're also a business partner with Question Pro. So we're happy about that. And so in today's episode, which is episode four, my guest today is Mr. Mark Mandel. And I'll let Mark introduce himself for a moment, but Mark and I have known each other for a while. I think we probably connected through the Customer Experience Professionals Association, where a lot of connections are made. And it's been many years. So happy to have you here, Mark, today to talk about this so exciting topic of artificial intelligence, what it all means to us, what it's probably going to mean to us in the future. So, um, but to start out with, you know, let's have Mark, I want you to uh, introduce yourself and get us started here and uh, just kind of kick us off. Sure. Thanks, Carl. And hi, everybody. I see a lot of, as I said earlier, a lot of my favorite CX people are on this call, and I'm excited to see you guys here. I'm Mark Mandel from Question Pro, and I joined the organization here just three or four months ago at the very, very end of last year. Um, in a in a in a uh, CX sales leadership and a leadership, but while I'm new to Question Pro, like Carl was saying, I've been in the CX community a long time. Uh, I'm, I'm going to probably be dating myself here, but I think I've been doing this type of work since long before they called it customer experience, and that's probably at this point 20 years. Uh, I also grew up fascinated by AI. And whether that be because of the movies from back then, I remember being impressionable the first time I saw a movie like 2001, where Hal was able to communicate and do things on its own, or in a pretty negative way, even the Terminator, the first time I saw that, Skynet was taking on an intelligence of its own. And I, I really have wanted to always take the opportunity, and I have finally found the opportunity for that to combine my fascination with CX and my fascination with AI and bring them together. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So Mark, just before we get into that topic here, I'll make the assumption here. I mean, we bandy these um, acronyms around a lot in any industry, but especially in the customer experience industry. But we, we, when you talk about AI, I want to make sure everybody knows what that really means. Kind of give us, a, you know, I know it says artificial intelligence, but boy, that could mean so many things. Can we narrow that down a little bit? Sure. You know, I'm going to, uh, for purposes of this call, I'm going to, um, I'm going to liberally steal a term that I believe was originated by the folks at Gartner. And, and they talked about AI in a pretty particular context that I think makes a great deal of sense and it makes it constructive for this use case. Instead of thinking about it as artificial intelligence, they talked about it as augmented intelligence. And what they really meant by augmented intelligence, you think about the world of customer experience and customer engagement and specifically folks who touch customers day in and day out, the front line. Are there ways that we can take some of the process that sits in the front line organizations and augment the human ability to better engage uh, customers in aggregate. What can we? What kind of repetitive tasks can we take out of their hands and automate them with a certain amount of intelligence? What can we do to expedite things, and in some cases help make recommendations even for decision making? All around the idea of making the human experience a little more efficient versus replacing us the way we all are afraid it might happen. So more about augmentation, less about replacement. Yeah, and I think it, we probably all, given that definition now, have encountered this in some way, shape, or form uh, recently. So what I wanted to do is we have a poll here that we're going to run, and Paulina, if you'd be so kind as to uh, lead us through that here, I think that will give us a, 
a good uh, way to start off here and get everyone engaged. We all yeah, love absolutely. goals, don't we? <laughs> so we have one for you here today. Fun. Now, get out your cell phones. I'm sure you have them. Okay, I hope that you are not seeing what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a word puzzle. <laughs> I'm just getting the QR code. You you scanned. I haven't scanned. Yeah, I've got this thing going a couple of times here, but it's given. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I think Pauline has to open the poll. Yeah, it's already here. Um, you guys see this? The QR code. Just scan it, or on the chat, I just put the link. So, okay. Oh, it's not working for me. It just it, it's not taking my pen. Mm. Well, you can try on the chat. I send the link. Yeah, I'll do it in the twelve. Carl, you're there. Marvel Hell US. Oh, it's giving, giving me the word puzzle again. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not getting. No, it. no, that's fine. You're there. I mean, we're just. That's just like the before waiting. Like we're just waiting. Oh, okay. So that's yeah. So we have to open the question. Gotcha. Yeah. Then I'm just gonna start. Yeah. Before and, uh, there's okay. So should we start? Let's sure. do it. Nine twelve. Yeah. Good. So the question: How do you feel about your experience with AI and customer service? I'm assuming that. Everyone has had some amount of experience in this. Either on the giving side or the taking side. Perfect. Mm. There's a lot of indifference about it. Wow. Mm. Well, it hasn't greatly worsened, let's put it that way, or somewhat worsened, so that's good. I'm wondering if indifference comes from just lack of prior experience, or it was neither good nor bad when you had the experience. Can one of you guys mention, take, the, take yourself off mute and maybe share a story about you know, it leaving you sort of middle of the road and affected by it? Uh, yeah, so I tried to post a comment about I'm in the same boat, just not, not enough to really, you know, any feelings. Got it. You know, I'm wondering, Mark, could it be that, you know, I might have had more experience with AI than I am aware of? <laughs> You no, know, it's possible. One, one of the interesting use cases that we'll talk about is almost replicating the human experience to a certain extent, especially in a frontline, like a customer service call center environment, where computers these days are replicating really natural sounding human voice even and engaging us in conversation um, and replacing to a certain extent that frontline agent with um, an auto attendant that's able to really carry on, you know, an, a human to human conversation. And you may not even realize you're talking with a computer until you're further into the talk. Yeah, especially if it's just words and I'm not hearing the voice, right? No, but I mean, even if it is spoken, I mean, the, the, the voice emulation now has gotten so natural sounding that it's really hard to tell apart from an actual, an actual person. There are some technologies out there that sound spookily like people talking. Well, what about A-L-E-X-A? And I can't say that name because it'll answer me and back me here. Sure. Or think about all the deep fakes that are out there now where people can replace somebody's voice with a different voice mm -hmm. and it sounds just like the original speaker. 
I mean, there's so much out there now where, where the old kind of robotic sounding voice synthesizer is a long ago relic and everything now is sounding like human beings talking in a conversational tone. It's come a long way. So, I mean, does, does that imply <laughs> excitement or caution? I guess that's my, let, let's delve into that a little bit here. Is there excitement around this or caution around this? I would say both. I would say I, I'm excited as hell about what's coming, but with caution, because I lived through a lot of other exciting, we'll call it AI waves in the past, and we're in the height of a wave right now again. I remember every time it was going to be earth shaking and breakthrough, and it was cool and exciting, but that breakthrough sort of fizzled out when the, when the uh, shortcomings became clearer. And I'm wondering, you know, even in the most modern sense, even in what we talk, we'll talk about in a few minutes, where we talk about AI generating original thought and original content, where are the limits there as well? But there's always sort of a glaring limit. And some of those limits could expose us as CX leaders. And in actually, instead of improving the experience for your customer, it might detract from it. And we want to be very mindful of that. So, Mark, before we move on to that, I think it would be uh, instructive here to reveal to the folks on the call here today that this poll was created by ChatGPT. Oh, boy, it's taken over our polling. <laughs> I just thought it was appropriate to have a, have a poll created by artificial intelligence and didn't do too bad, did it? No, I, I like the fact that you didn't put out a spoiler alert, though, before, and tell us before we did the poll that that's how it was done. <laughs> okay, Mark, so let's let's get into the meat of the matter here, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, because you know, you've had some obviously passion around both that and CX. We want to talk about how those two are eventually integrating and how is it going to help us, hinder us make us happy, you know, tick us off or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so I was going to talk about two or three, I'll call them the CX stories. Um, kind of one from long ago, one from more recent, and one from kind of current times. And, and we'll kind of take, treat them as kind of a look at the past, maybe a little bit of, a, of the present, and maybe even a little bit of the near-term future. If you look at the past first, kind of what shaped a lot of my personal point of view about AI and CX, the use case around AI from long ago was originally uh, helping to facilitate things like website access. And I could tell you a story because it comes down to a very personal role that I had at a company years ago, nearly 25 years ago, where they wanted to use, the use case was around e-commerce on early e-commerce websites. And the thought process was, if you can't navigate the site well and effective and find the merchandise that you're hoping to buy, you're probably not going to buy it. And the thought is that, can AI help me navigate to a place on a site to find information that I need to conduct business? And that the way they were going to do that, they were going to put a little, think of it like an avatar, like a little animated character on your website that had natural language conversational capabilities where instead of clicking your way through the website, you can literally talk to that avatar through written words in a natural language and it would interpret what you wanted and help you get the information you were looking for. Um, that company had, had some big plans around how that was gonna really revolutionize the world of AI and electronic commerce sales back in the day. Well. The, the, the cautionary tale that came out of that was an opportunity that we were pursuing with that technology at one of our uh, prospective customers. In this case, you know, it's long ago, so I could talk about it. Uh, it was an opportunity at McDonald's. McDonald's Corporation, you know, the hamburger guys, wanted the ability to put a little animated avatar of Ronald McDonald on their website. And you could talk to Ronald through written words, and it would help navigate the website to get nutritional information, location-based information, and a variety of other things, all without having to click the mouse or whatever you're gonna do. It was all about ask Ronald for help and Ronald got you the help you were looking for. McDonald's loved the idea of that idea and they brought us into their Chicago office to, um, to give a final presentation as, a, you know, as part of an RFP. 
and we gave we 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 wired up that 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 Ronald demo, and it was really compelling from the outside in. But let's be honest about it. Back in those days, AI was very crude. And what it really meant back then, think about from a programming perspective, Carl, this was all a bunch of kind of if then statements. So if somebody used the word this or that, or let's say nutrition or hamburger or location, it would hardwire you to a specific outcome, a certain page, a certain piece of information, some content. And People would go in and say, you know, what, what, how many calories are in a hamburger? And it would tell you how many calories are in a hamburger. And so we went to Chicago to give that big presentation. And it was going so well that we went off script. And when we went off script, Ronald got kind of out of his element. And we opened in that room, we opened it up to a bunch of uh, McDonald's executives. We said, what would you like to ask Ronald as a final proof point of this? And somebody, I think it was a technical engineer who was in the back of the room, shouted out, ask Ronald what's inside a chicken McNugget. So we kind of bullishly went, what's inside a chicken McNugget? And no lie, the answer came back, Ray Kroc. And if you don't know who Ray Kroc is, he was the esteemed uh, founder of their corporation. And I should say we got laughed out of the room. We got laughed out of the opportunity and thrown out of the building. Uh, the cautionary tale there, back in those days, CX and AI were too simplistic when you had to hardwire things together to make them work. And if you go off that planned script, you got into trouble very quickly. A little more recent, I was doing work um, in a little more exciting kind of way at a company, and many of us know, I was an early employee at a company called Clarabridge. Clarebridge was certainly, you know, became a, a rising star over the years in the world of using AI, but instead of generating content or navigating through content, it was more about interpreting content analytically. And to summarize some of that content, then they figured out a way to kind of crack the code to use not just hardwired rules, but real um, natural language processing and ling linguistic capabilities uh, behind the scenes to start to understand not just what did somebody say, or what words did they use? But what did they mean? What was their expression? What were they trying to say, regardless of the actual literal phrasing of their words? And that was a breakthrough. That was a huge, huge breakthrough when those guys did that, where they, for the first time, it didn't matter if you said lawsuit or any kind of derivative of lawsuit. It knew how to bucket that into, the, let's say, the legal thematic bucket. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a door opener for that company and for the industry. And now it, they're taking it one final leap. And you guys probably have seen the news. Um, it's almost unavoidable. Carl, like you were saying earlier, you put on the evening news and see this generative technology, tools that can actually write or generate content, orig theoretically original content. Things like this chat GPT, you know, and similar derivatives of that work. That's taking things to another level now where instead of it you know, sourcing information for you or interpreting or summarizing information, now AI can actually write or generate original content. Well, that's probably the single most exciting CX use case that you can think of because you think about repetitive tasks there. You think about folks in your frontline service centers that are taking calls or chats or emails day in and day out. If you can start to augment their abilities with a point and click response that's actually generated on the fly for that customer based on that interaction and let them just kind of eyeball it and send it out in an augmented sort of way, that's a huge win. You'll cut down on things like error rates. You'll cut down on things like handle time. You'll cut down on things just like um, overall effort of the, of the frontline associate to serve your customer. Uh, the risks are that again, we don't wanna to put too much blind adherence in what this type of, even this modern technology is generating for fear that you know, if we just blindly shoot out an AI written response, it could be way off the reservation. And so that's why I'm saying I'm excited by what's coming and I'm excited even by what's here, but I wanna be cautionary that it's probably far from perfect at this point. 
So, you know, Mark, that raises a question in my mind, okay, because it sounds like over time, this gives, this is getting smart, AI is getting smarter and smarter over time. And so if you were to look at a timeline, you know, you talked about, you know, natural language uh, uh, processing in Clara Bridge and so and that was a few years ago. I mean, where would you put us today? And where do you think that, you know, line extends out into the future? I'm sure it's infinite. I'm sure that as time goes on, it's going to be infinitely smarter and smarter than it is. But, you know, we tend to look at some of the simplistic things today and say, well, you know, it's not very, I asked it to give me a summary of a book that I just read. And it had no idea that the book was even written. Yep. That's because its data point, I think it was September of 2021 or something like that, was its cutoff point. So therefore, anything that happened or was published after that, it didn't know about. So what do you what do you think we are in that in that continuum? Are we in the you know first quartile, or you think we're f further along than that? Oh, I think it's just in its infancy, and I think the curve is going to start to curve up exponentially, and not just a linear growth curve. When you think about it, you know, the way that these tools improve, and I'm going to dare you use the words get smarter, is by learning as they go through people challenging the engines, right? So if if software thinks it's derived an answer and the, and the user says, nope, that's not the right answer, and we challenge its response, it will attempt to learn or relearn what the right response is. And if you have enough people using these tools, uh, the, the learning rate will be exponentially quick. And I'm going to give a real life example of that outside of the CX realm, but it'll make the point pretty quickly. You know, when you now for a car, I was very excited as kind of an AI advocate to go out a couple of years ago and buy a self driving Tesla. And, you know, you, you can't get a more exciting technology to me than a car that could drive itself. And I couldn't wait to drive in that car and have it take me to where I wanted to go and have it be magical. And I'm going to start off by telling you initially, it's a pretty cool, magical experience before the terror kicks in. But that's a different discussion. But the reason I bring up Tesla in general with this is what they're doing is really smart. They built a, a major, uh, like a supercomputer out in their office in California. And every Tesla that's on the road that has this driving self-driving tool in it has cameras all over that car and sensors all over that car. And as I'm out there driving, it's constantly sending information back from my car and every other Tesla that's on the road to this supercomputer. So in effect, it's watching me drive and it's watching itself drive and learning from the experience times millions of people on the road. And as, as we continue to stream information from our cars back to that supercomputer running these AI models, it's starting to learn things like, how do other drivers behave? What's a dog in the road look like? What's a mailbox? What's a tree? And it'll know how to navigate these things and how to anticipate behaviors the more it experiences them. And by having millions of cars in that fleet all sending data back literally 24 hours a day during drive time, that computer is going to continue to learn and get smarter and smarter and smarter. But again, it's not going to be a straight line like this. It's going to be a curve up. So I anticipate while we're just in the infancy of its learning, the reality is we're going to get pretty mature very quickly. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking of something probably a little bit unrelated to CX here, but I mean, it's too bad that we couldn't get AI to be good at predicting weather. Because you know, weather forecasters don't seem to be able to hit that, um, you know, for the most part, at least in the Northeast here. So I don't know what is it, other parts. But they are using, they are, weather guys are trying to use AI to do predictive modeling to say, I believe, you know, this weather system is going to come in or it's going to change course. It's trying to predict models of, when you think about like Carl, by you in the winter um, in the Northeast, you know, it's always when's the next snowstorm coming? And the reality is they model different weather patterns and say, it looks like, you know, next Tuesday, we have a high risk of a snowstorm. They don't know. I mean, that cloud could change direction, but the reality is they think based on the model, it's coming. And that's a form of AI. So, so I had this predictor of the New England weather 
predicted by the woolly mammoth caterpillar. If anybody's ever seen that or know that, it's a black and brown caterpillar in the fall. And when the caterpillar has a wide brown stripe, that means it's going to be a mild winter. So hmm. without AI, that was my AI. That's how I predicted our mild, the mildness of the winter we had here. <laughs> yeah, but, but think about in the world of customer experience, though, I mean, there are so many opportunities to augment that human interaction, right? And the ones I keep coming back to are the most obvious, things that are repetitive task-based work. So call center type work, definitely. I mean, it's all about that. It could be um, obvious use cases like taking, um, think about a, a call center agent. They spend as much or more time on what they call after call work than they do during a call. So Carl, you call customer care from a company, you talk to them, they resolve your problem, they hang up the call, they go put notes in the system and they disposition your call, right? That could take, if you're on a two minute call, it could take another two or three minutes to actually properly and thoughtfully disposition that call. And to the extent AI can listen into that call and alleviate the, the repetitive task of dispositioning that conversation, that's a huge win for the organization because especially companies that are you know, pay by the minute in like a BPO setting for a call center where they're outsourcing to a third party call center provider, you know, every minute is on the clock. And if you could trim a minute or trim a minute and a half out of your handle time, that could be a multi-million dollar win. At the same time, it takes a lot of pressure off your frontline agents. Um, imagine if you have the ability to do call screening and call direction to a more well-trained agent or more senior agent based on the initially engaging that caller up front with an auto attendant that could actually engage them conversationally and not push one for this and two for that, but where they could explain in their own words, why are they calling and carry on a little bit of dialogue before handing it off to that agent. Again, in the spirit of making the agent's life easier, uh, less pressure on the agent makes them less prone to quit, uh, makes them more, more, um, more resilient around errors and handling of a lot of calls and handling a lot of pressure because these guys are under a ton of pressure. And the idea that AI is a really constructive tool in those use cases. There's nothing wrong with doing that with AI. Uh, again, look at the world of insurance. Insurance companies have used AI for years in what they call RPA, robotic process automation. This idea that I can take a process of clicking here, typing there, doing a certain set of tasks over and over and over again, like handling a claim filing, can all be done with automation now and AI-driven automation and take a lot of those cycles right off the table. We're less error rate, less prone for human oversight and process a heck of a lot more cases more quickly during the day. Yeah, so that's, yeah that's interesting. I um. You know, there was some years ago that I worked in the field of robotics and automation, mm -hmm. and it was specifically in the biotech world, in the laboratories where there were the repetitive tasks. Mm -hmm. Those were ideally suited to that because it didn't make the kinds of mistakes. It didn't get tired like a human did. So I think that's the concept we're talking about here, that that's yeah. really ideally what it's suited for. But, you know, there's always that downside, you know, I mean, Again, we talked about ChatGPT earlier here when we had our poll that was created by ChatGPT. And I don't know what you think of that. Um, but, you know, there's obviously opportunities to both misuse and disuse the te technology. So how do, you, how do you feel about that? I mean, talk a little bit more about ChatGPT because that's something accessible to a lot of us here. You know, I've got a, I signed up for an account and I got it right away, so... Yeah, me too. I've been enjoying playing with it. You know, I, I'm, I'm using it purely experimentally today on my own, but I'll give you a real world commercial use case. I look at my company, Question Pro, and we said, you know, it's an interesting opportunity to leverage the, the same GPT um, text handling and authoring engine in a voice of the customer use case. And the way we've deployed it, it's kind of cool. Uh, think about if you were a survey builder, you are a voice of the customer practitioner, and you want to sit down and make a brand new survey instrument, a brand new survey project. 
you know, well, you could certainly, you know, think through it manually and create it manually a question at a time and make sure it's set up just so. Or we have a part of our product now called QX Bot. And QX Bot lets us go in there and literally describe the survey that we want, kind of like Carl, like how you did the poll. Right. And you could say, write me a 20 question survey about, I don't know, consumer preferences about European airline travel. And a minute later, you have a 20 question survey about European airline travel. And it's all programmed up in the system and ready to go. That can't be any cooler than that. I mean, it's both around the standpoint of creating efficiencies and overall effectiveness. So the VOC leader who's looking to crank out a bunch of new surveys and do so with a level of precision and accuracy in how you write them. And our QX bot based on GP, the GPT engine is a real life use case for creating original survey content with the click of a mouse. Couldn't be cooler, couldn't be easier and super and super constructive for the CX leader. Yeah, but I, I would suppose though, what the real what, what in reality you should be doing with this is not necessarily just taking that for, at face value, but using that right. you talk about augmented reality. You know what I mean? Uh, augmented intelligence. I mean, I would take that as the starting point because I've actually asked you know uh, Chat GPT to write a write a set of song lyrics for me. Yep. <laughs> And, you know, I give it a topic and it will write this series of, you know, verses and bridges and, and choruses and things of that nature. But I look at that and I say, well, I might not really express it that way. So I use that as a starting point. So exactly. that's the key word starting point. I think that's the exact right way to look at it. It gives you a, a building point or a launching off point that you can take it and, and improve upon it and make it better. The one cautionary tale I'll tell you about this. And I'm still learning about this to, to be entirely upfront about it. I worry about the risk of, of unanticipated plagiarism and the idea that this has learned how to create this content. And I use that term loosely. And I'm wondering to what extent is a tool like the GPT engine giving me truly original content? And to what extent is it borrowing content from other sources that it's that it has learned from over the years? And I'm unknowingly taking somebody else's work and positioning it as my own as original because of it. Yeah. So I want to be thoughtful that there's some risk and you got to go back and double, triple check that um, because you don't want to have to deal with those kind of hassles if it comes along. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot of folks here probably have a lot of things going on in their mind at this point from what we've been discussing here. So I want to give an opportunity here. Sometimes we do breakouts here, but I think in the interest of time, since, uh, you know, we have about 10 minutes left here, let's just open up the floor here to some comments and questions. Uh, Eric, it looked like you went on camera here, looked like you were eager to say something. So I'm like, Eric's going to jump in. I know it. <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to jump in and support both of you. It's been a good conversation, but I, I love Mark's last point about um, potential for plagiarism. And I, I think it's actually a two-way street, right? A, did we accidentally plagiarize someone versus how easy does it become to, um, to be plagiarized or, or lose control of your own intellectual property? So uh, sure. I think that's going to be an interesting dynamic as it goes forward is, you know, I mean, I've got two kids, two kids in college, and I'm almost tempted to apply my third kid named chat GPT in college <laughs> to see what kind of grades it could actually get, because I do think it's going to get to a point where <laughs> it could pass and get a college degree itself for you. There was an example. Somebody tried an earlier build of the GPT engine to write a master's thesis, and it actually achieved it and got the degree. <clears throat> Not, su not surprised at all. <laughs> right, I mean, it, so you run the risk. Now, what's going to happen to the education system if kids are using this as a way to skirt the responsibility of creating, you know, reports and articles and papers in school, if they could just farm it off to AI and claim it as their own? Yeah. You know, how do you police that? Well, you know what that makes me think of, Mark, and you and I talked about this earlier. Um, there's that ancient uh, game of Go. It's kind of like chess on steroids, if you will. Yeah. And there was a group of from Google that created Alpha Go, which was supposed to be like it gave it uh, all these information about past games so that this actually computer could figure out 
all the different moves because the number of permutations of moves in AlphaGo is more than the number of atoms in the universe. <laughs> so it makes it quite complex here. But um, I watched the I watched the actual full documentary movie on this thing where they took this Go champion from Korea by the name this guy by the name of Lee Sedol, and he thought he would win all five games. It was a, it was a playoff, and he lost four of the five games against the machine, and it was devastating for him. I'll just put that in the chat for anybody who is interested in that because I thought it was a fascinating video, and it gives you this kind of to me a window into the potential for AI. I'm sure it's gotten even better than that because you know you it, again it learns over time. How long ago, Carl, do you think it was when um, IBM's was it Deep Blue system was on Jeopardy and it won Jeopardy? Yeah, I know. Yeah, it was a while ago. <laughs> be Twenty years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and this was only here. This was from 2016, 17, I think. This Alpha Go. Uh, so anyway. Good to check out. I see uh, Jerry, you're on camera. It looks like you have a comment or a question for us. Uh, yeah, I have a human question. <laughs> in, in the, you would in bring the, that up, wouldn't you? <laughs> in, in the middle of all this. Uh, you know, I see people just going berserk over the suspicious since chat GPT came out. Uh, uh, as I did, you know, in multiple waves of fascination over AI, pick a date. I mean, the 90s, the 2000s, or what have you. So, Mark and Carl, what counsel do you have about how much bandwidth to allocate to worrying about this uh, in our work? I mean, you know, sh should it be top of mind and should it be, you know, passively monitoring? I mean, everybody can't worry about all of this all of the time and also do all their other work. I think it's going to, in my opinion, I think what we're talking about here in terms of this new type of generative technology that can create content, theoretically original content, it's going to change the workforce dynamic where, you know, people are really freaked out by the potential of getting, getting replaced at work by software. And I don't know that that's so much of a risk. Um, even if you're a direct content, if your whole job is creating new original content, I'm not sure that that's a big risk. I was listening to somebody else in the world of content creators talk a lot about the threat of chat GPT to their jobs and to what extent do they really need to be on top of this and make it their job. And, and the thought came out of that was while chat GPT and derivative tools may create content over time that's user user friendly and effective, the role that you or I, Jerry, might have around you know creating that content today is going to change. And we're going to move from being content writers to content optimizers. And we're going to be more in a role of looking at things like, well, how do we take this generative technology that's making content for my company and make it now so that it's truly like SEO optimized so we can find it and monetize it. What do we need to do to create proper keyword structures around it? All the things that go into content monetization in that example. And to whatever extent that becomes the job, you know, then it becomes just hu a huge booster for that. But I don't see that as even a significant part of our process, probably for at least another year or 18 months out. But I think today the role of AI in our work is uh, creative expression and experimental use cases today, as opposed to going full hog, going into this thing in a production setting, again, for the cautionary reasons we've talked about. And I think that over the next year, that exponential curve is gonna continue to tighten things up and make it stronger and make it smarter and make it more presentable and maybe a little less risk prone. And if we could do that well, I think the deliverable a year or two down the road from now is going to be very, very different than it is even today. Today, it's an, an exciting demo. I think a year or two from now, it's going to be an exciting mainstream part of all of our jobs. And I think we're going to just need to, to roll with that and adapt our own work styles around them and, and create, create a place in our workforce for AI to be doing some of that work that we're putting in front of humans today to do. I believe that's an inevitable outcome. 
Yeah, so, Mark, I'll, uh, I'll bonus, bonus round. I think I think you're right. It will replace certain tasks, mm -hmm. right? Coding open ends and digesting large pieces, you know, large amounts of material. But but what it can't do, or what it won't ever do, is replace the creativity and imagination of the human brain, right? So it can learn faster than us. It can process all the stuff that's out there that we couldn't process in a lifetime. But it can't. Um, it, it can't come up with the next creative movie or the next imaginary new innovative product, or it probably will even struggle with the so what? Hey, I've digested all of this. Great. What does it mean and what do I actually do about it? And so, so in many ways, I think our work changes because, okay, that will happen faster for us. Now we can jump to implications and and yep. actions faster than we could in the past. And so I think it becomes, I think it becomes a tool that we have to learn how to use, but it will actually make us more productive and, and get to outcomes faster. You know, it's interesting you say that. If you look at the news when GPT became a thing in the popular media over the last three or four months, I guess, this year, um, there was an article how Google had thought that they had a lock on this whole AI business. And and their their whole kind of cash cow for search, and all of a sudden they had to call what they called a code red meeting at Google headquarters, because they all of a sudden found, oh my God, our cash cow might be dying if you don't if they're changing the paradigm from a search paradigm to an authoring paradigm. But instead of searching for other people's content, you can make your own by pushing a button. Yeah. And all of a sudden, that was terror came across Google's leadership team. And, and, you know, in some ways, that's really exciting. And in some cases, I saw an article where they referred to this moment that we're sitting in right now as kind of AI's what they call net, Netscape moment. And for those of you guys that remember the early days of the web and a company called Netscape that came on kind of, for lack of a better term, initially, remember. Uh, initially brought forward a commercially viable web browser for the first time, right? That was a game changer. It changed every part of the internet for people and it made it accessible to people where it was previously inaccessible. And then look what happened to Netscape. They're a footnote in history, right? And so I think you're gonna see this is sort of AI's Netscape, but what's gonna be the next step that comes along? You know, what's going to be the next thing that takes it forward and, and builds on that Netscape moment and now makes this tool pervasive and commonplace? Well, and, you, know, you know, Mark, speaking of next step, I mean, this was only in the last few days now, GPT-4 came out. Oh, my God, yes. And I, and I started looking into that. And some of the examples are pretty amazing here. So it had uh, the computer actually in the position of, instructing that goes back to your comments, Eric, about the kids in school and stuff like that. So it was about si solving a mathematic, two simultaneous equations, okay? And so it had the computer is in the in the role of teacher, right? And so the student would, you know, would need to solve these two simultaneous equations. And what the student asked first of it, it says, can you just give me the answer? Just, you know, because this is what we're all concerned about, right? Just give me the answer. Well, it didn't. It actually led the, the the student through the process of learning how to do that, and it led them to to getting the answer on their own. But it used the Socratic method, so I thought, "Well, this is pretty cool stuff." And uh, there was another part of it where they took the um, uh, they took a picture of an, an an iPhone and a picture of an old uh, you know cable that you would connect your printer to your com computer and it looked like it was connected to the iphone and and it showed a package that that original connector came in it and asked gpt4 to identify what was in each of those pictures but more importantly what was wrong with that picture we probably should have had that over here and just show and sh displayed that to the group here and say what's wrong with this picture well obviously you know that kind of a connector doesn't go in a lightning cable on the end of, a, of an iphone but the but you know GPT four figured that out or came up with that conclusion. So it has that ability to reason now the ability to reason that that answer out. Hey Carl, so, it dawns on me as you're talking. You know, we're all here talking a lot about this GPT and the new version, version four. 
it dawns on me that some of us on this call may not know how to try it. Do you, can you share the URL? Do you know the URL for the company behind that? So if we it's, wanted it's to open AI. Um, open and AI. I, open AI. And I forget the URL. I'm just checking it in here. Open AI. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's openai.com. Well, there you go. Let me just copy it and put that right there, right there in the chat. And you can, you can, uh, I mean, there's a lot of use of this thing right now. So there's a lot of people on there. Um, so it's hard. Sometimes I probably tried three or four times before I got to be able to get a log on for it. But once you get there, it's, it's kind of interesting to just play around with, you know, it gives you just kind of some new insights as to what's possible. Carl, do you have access to it for two minutes? Do you want to open up a browser and do something fun with GPT and show the folks here what it looks like? Uh, let's see if I can do my uh, OpenAI login here. Hold on one second here. This is Saturday Night Live here, right? <laughs> We're making it. This could be the, um, the what's inside a Chicken McNugget moment for us. We never know. Okay, let's see if I can get you to go to my login page here. Da, 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 da. No, it's not letting me, it's not letting me get there. That's the, I think this whole open AI thing is still sort of in a beta mode right now. So it might be for some reason. Okay, here we go. We, we got here. Okay, we got here. All right, I'm going to share screen. Who would like to you know, throw out, I'm going to, I'm going to re recreate the moment I had at McDonald's 20 years ago. Who wants to ask chat GPT something through Carl? And let's see if we can get it to write something for us. Anybody have a request? What's in a chicken McNugget? Oh my goodness! Here we go. <laughs> Troublemaker. Do we do we want that one, Mark? <laughs> uh, well, we could let's try it. I mean, we could. It could always come back and say, "I don't know." What? Okay, I got to be able to type right. What's in a chicken McNugget? Question mark. Yeah. Hopefully, it won't say Ray Kroc. <laughs> now see the little cursors kind of flashing there because it's um it's thinking and obviously there's a lot of folks probably who are using it at this point in time so it could, sometimes it could take a minute or so for something to come up but we'll, well see there it comes nuggets are a popular item on the mcdonald's menu and they are made from bite-sized pieces of chicken that have been breaded and deep fried. The ingredients in chicken McNuggets can vary slightly depending on the country and the specific recipe used by the restaurant. But typically they contain one, chicken meat, the primary ingredient. Various parts of the chicken. <laughs> wow. So interesting that, that this is being purported to be original content here. This is not being scraped off of a website somewhere. This is not being pulled down from McDonald's.com. <laughs> This is the AI kind of figuring out what's inside a chicken McNugget from a variety of content sources and putting this text together for Carl on the fly. Yeah, so uh, Mark, I just put the wiki link. So I just did a Google search on the same question. Mm -hmm. So can you compare and contrast the, the, the use cases? What is ChatGPT doing that you couldn't do for yourself in, a, in an opportunity to for the purposes of an article like this this is an opportunity to create original content especially if you want to take it and cautionarily share it out to others right sourcing information on a pure research model through search is good if you want to learn yourself what's inside a chicken mcnugget but obviously not the most ideal medium for republication well, all right. So how about this question? How, how can I improve the taste of chicken McNuggets? That's an interesting question. So, so that shouldn't be in anybody's database, right? 
I would think not. So let's find out if yeah. AI so so let's see if let's see what it does with that. I'm 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 as curious as you are. Let's see what happens here. Yeah, yeah. Taste is a matter of personal preference. There are some suggestions. Try dipping sauces. Add seasoning if you want more garlic powder, paprika. Make them spicy. Tabasco. <laughs> Tabasco fixes everything. <laughs> Cook them differently. Okay, so this is a good compare and contrast, isn't it? Yep. So yeah, this I mean, again, you when know, you asked a question about the world as it is, it was the same as a you know just a Google search. And you know the interesting thing because this is not just GPT but Chat GPT. Yeah. This chat interface, and so Carl could go back into the text box down on the bottom and and carry on a further request about what it just generated, and say, "Can you clarify seasoning in the, as in number two? Yeah, yeah. We'll come back and and deepen its conversational discourse around seasoning. Yeah. So, what seasonings would you recommend? So it's part of this conversation. And I think mm -hmm. yeah, to your question, Jerry, that's what the difference is. You know, if I wanted to Google this kind of stuff, I'd have to do all the researching and, and collecting all this information to kind of put it in a paragraphical form where this thing yeah. here is kind of giving me all that. It's kind of going out there in the universe of what it knows and kind of assembling all that for me. Yeah. That's the, uh, you know, you know the uh, the book report that you need to turn in and your in, in your in your high school <laughs> you know English class or something like that could be I, I throw that out there but it could be generated by something like this. Yep. Carl, thanks for showing us this. Yeah. Oh, cool. cool. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Mark. Hey, Carl. I realize yeah. we're coming to the top of the hour, and, we're, and many of us are going to probably have to run off this call. So. Um, you know, time just goes by so quickly when I talk about things like this that I'm fascinated by. Well, I thank you for bringing that topic to us. And it was an exciting one when you and I talked about it. Um, we are out of time here. It's actually, we're, we're over time, but we tend to do that on these episodes because we get into these topics quite a bit. So thank you, Mark, for your participation today and everybody else here. And uh, look forward to the next episode. I don't think we have one lined up quite yet, but stay tuned. We will be announcing that pretty darn soon. We do these every month on the same, what is it? The third uh, Tuesday of the month. So the word they used to say, Carl, same bat time, same bat channel. Yeah. So that would be, as I look at my calendar over here, that would be the 18th of April at, at you know, the same time here, 11 a.m. Central Time. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining and participating.